So if you've ever wondered what it's like to plan a flight over 3,000 miles, flying that flight within just several days, then this video will show you what that's like and we're gonna do it all on the iPad. All right, welcome everyone. My name is Chris Palmer from Angle of Attack and I'm broadcasting to you today from my studio here in Alaska. So you guys have seen some of the recent videos. You saw the announcement of the fact that we're flying this Cessna 172, two, three and a form from Homer, Alaska, all the way down to Oshkosh, Wisconsin. The goal is to get the avionics redone over the winter time so that it can be ready for summer flying and the busy Alaska flying season. A lot of you have been asking what that flight planning process would be like. Obviously, it's a huge journey with a lot of considerations. So as a commercial pilot, as an instructor, today I wanna to take you through this thought process, why we chose to go the way we did and how we're gonna break it up, et cetera, et cetera. So we're gonna go through that thought process. We're gonna get into the nitty gritty of the flight planning here with four flight on the iPad, and it should be a really great, entertaining and educational process. So let's dive right in. So first off, I wanna break things down in the PAVE acronym. The PAVE acronym is something that I use quite a bit and like a lot of mnemonics in aviation, it's something to give us a bit of a framework. So the first thing we're going to work on is P for pilot. I'll talk to you about some of the personal minimums that we're going to have during the process. So A for aircraft, what are some of the things that we want to get done and ready before we actually go on this journey? And then today, largely, the biggest thing that we're going to cover is V, the environment, and that is the weather, the route we're flying, uh, possible places to land, uh, services along the way and all of those factors playing into where we should go and how we should go there and how hard we can push to get from Alaska down to Canada. It is a process that has to be broken down. It's kept me up at night just kind of thinking about all the different scenarios and so that's going to be what we're breaking down as well. Obviously doing a big trip like this there are a lot of external pressures and that's the final E in PAVE. We're going to talk about those external pressures and our mitigation factors that we're going to use to make sure that we're kind of in a personal minimum sort of framework for this flight. So I'm going to go through some of those now before we dive into the iPad so that you guys can understand that process. So P for pilot. Let's start there in the PAVE acronym and this is kind of the framework that the flight planning needs to fit within. So we're gonna have some pretty hard and fast rules that we're, we're going to keep to just to make sure that we're not getting ourselves in a bind. And these will make sense as I say them and I can explain them just briefly, each one of them. So first is we don't wanna do any night flying at all. Uh, just in the mountains where we're flying, we are unfamiliar with the route. It's just something that we don't wanna do. We wanna kinda hang it up at night. We're not gonna do any flying IFR. Um, not only does this airplane not have the right equipment yet, but uh, we don't want to be doing it in the mountains in the winter time in the Canadian Rockies in the areas that we're flying through. So that's kind of a no no as well. One of the things we want to do is we want to fly near civilization the entire time. So part of our plan or part of our big thought process through this is we want to fly over roads the entire time. As you get into rural parts of Alaska and Canada, the second you go off the road system, you're in a remote area and we just want to make sure that we have options, that we're fairly close to civilization the entire time. And so that's largely going to dictate the kind of route that we fly. It may mean we fly a little bit further to make sure that we're within those services, but really we kind of don't have another option because we need to fill up with fuel along the way and we need places to stay and things like that. So it just kind of makes sense that we're going to follow at least through part of Alaska and Canada to make sure that we are within safe distance of civilization and help. Another thing we wanna do each night is make sure that the airplane is hangered and that we stay in a hotel. Uh, two reasons there, the biggest thing is just ice with the airplane, making sure that it's nice and warm so that in the morning when we go to fly, we can just kind of get right into it right away and get our day started with a, a big jump start. And then resting at night. It's going to be uh, an arduous journey. We're going to be doing nine, 10 hour days each day flying. So we definitely want to 
um, be on top of our rest. And that's part of the I'm safe checklist that's so important as part of the P for pilot in the PAVE checklist. So the A in PAVE is aircraft and that's mostly covered in other videos in this series. So make sure that you go to this link up here for those extra videos. It'll also be in the description. There's a playlist of all of these videos that we're doing and we're kind of doing this journey in chronological order. So right now, as part of this flight planning session that we're doing with you guys, that is part of the pre-planning for the entire trip. But we also have a lot of other things going on at the airplane, getting 100 hour done, packing up our emergency and survival gear, making sure that our weight and balance is correct, going through all the, the nuts and bolts of even the cameras and just making sure that everything is good to go. We have the equipment we need and we're ready for that trip. So the A in aircraft for PAVE is mostly encompassed in other videos. So make sure you go and check those out because today we are mostly going to be doing again the V for environment and uh, that's part of the pay checklist that typically deals with most of your flight planning stuff. So now what we're going to do is I'm going to pull up the iPad and we're just going to go through this entire journey kind of beginning to end, kind of start big picture and talk about some of the things that are considerations on this trip. So let's dive right into the iPad and check that out. So first off, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do a really simple leg from Homer, which is Peho, to Oshkosh, which is Kosh. All right. You can see that this spans the continent almost. It's a very long journey and we wouldn't necessarily want to just take that trip straight, just going straight through. Obviously, we want to hop and jump to different airports. We want to have options. And so we have to start breaking this down little by little and day by day and leg by leg to make sure that we can do this trip. Now, typically there are two separate options that you can take when flying through Canada from Alaska. The first one, and I'll just kind of clear out our, our route here. The first one is to fly from, fly basically down what's called the inside passage and you would go down to the Seattle area to the Washington area, and then we could go to the east from there. Um, the problem is that the weather almost all times a year is, is worse than inside or inland. So it's really tricky there. There's just a lot of weather on the coast, a lot of low weather. Of course, during the winter, you're not just dealing with rain and clouds and low ceilings, but you're dealing with icing, freezing rain, and, and just storms that are unpredictable. It could kind of keep us down for days. And so as I started to look at the other option, which is the Alcan Highway, the Alaska Canada Highway, this one started to look a lot more attractive to me. So that one, if I can just clear everything out here, is going to be from Homer. And I'm just going to draw a really crude line because I don't quite have this laid out but it's gonna kind of be like this, all right? And then from there, we would um, we would go southbound a little bit. So that's the Alcan Highway route. As I was laying awake in bed late, many nights, looking at the weather on the coast, looking at the weather in say Whitehorse or Watson Lake or uh, Fort Nelson, which are some airports that we'll be passing through. I just noticed that time and time again, the weather was better interior rather than on the coastline. And so as I juggled the options and thought, hey, you know, if I'm gonna go for this, give myself two weeks to do the whole trip, um, obviously not wanting to give myself any undue external pressure, but still wanting to do it in a fast, ma uh, uh, an efficient manner, maybe not so fast, I just wanna be smart. Um, it just made sense that even though it would be a little faster theoretically to go along the coastline, you get down south faster, you get to warmer weather faster. It didn't really make all that much sense because there were going to be times where likely we'd be stuck at airports for days at a time and the services aren't that good anyway and the options aren't that good along the way. We just have very few options on our way down. The plus side of that is we wouldn't have to deal with customs or anything. We would just do one stop in Canada for fuel and that would be it. 
and they would let us through to go down to Port Angeles and Washington. That's a likely route. But basically, we've ended up on the fact that we are going to fly the interior or the Alcan Highway. So I kind of did this crude drawing here and now I want to show you day by day how that's broken down and how we can start to kind of build that out. I think a fun exercise to just start this process would be to do that route again from Homer to Oshkosh and then just start to kind of uh, pick the different airports and slide that route to the different airports that are gonna work. So let me show you what that process is like and we'll do that right now. So I still have that Homer to Oshkosh in here. I'm just gonna hit go again. That brings that up. I'm going to go to aeronautical uh, charts and we are going to stop for fuel in Anchorage. Let's do just airports. So Anchorage, we're gonna go up to Palmer and pass over that. And I'm just gonna start picking these airports that we're following along the way. This is Tok Alaska, which would be one of our last stops. And then we st start to follow the Alcan Highway the Alcan Highway doesn't go through all of Alaska, it just goes through part of the Canadian Rockies and like Eastern Alaska. So once we get to Toke and start to make our way down to Whitehorse, Watson Lake, Fort Nelson, that's all the Alcan Highway. So we'll just start to draw kind of some crude lines here. Of course, the flight planning would be a little bit more involved when we actually go and do it, but we're following the road here. Hey y'all, a real quick message here. If you're enjoying this video and doing flight training now or in the near future, check out our online ground school. Pass the written test, prepare for flight training, and become a safe aviator. And you get to support this channel at the same time. Join today at angleofattack.com. All right, back to the video. So let me pull this route down here. There's Whitehorse. Um, you can see the road right here on the map so this line here is the road and it even says the alaska canada highway which you can see there all right so i'm going to clear that again all right so then we want to go down into this area fly over that we're going to just hop and skip to different airports along the way following the highway. Again, this isn't a perfect flight plan compared to what we're gonna be doing. There's Watson Lake, here's Fort Nelson. You can see that the terrain on the left-hand side of the map is starting to die out. We're starting to get more into the, the, uh, the Alberta area or rather where the Rocky Mountains are dissipating and getting into more plains and farmland and just flatter, which is nice. So. So then that's Fort Nelson. Now here is, here's a conundrum right here already because we really could fly from Fort Nelson and just kind of hop and skip our way down through Canada and end up in Wisconsin. That's actually a pretty good way to go. Uh, once we're out of the Rockies, we have a lot more options in terms of airports. But one of the considerations we had is, hey, the biggest thing we're thinking about in terms of safety and things is cold weather. And what about just getting south as fast as we possibly can and getting to warmer weather? So we found that we could cross customs in Great Falls, Montana. It would take us, as you'll see here, I'll just kind of drag this one down. It's gonna be a big leg. Kind of takes us along that edge of the mountains there all the way down. Of course, we're gonna be stopping at different airports here like Grand Prairie is a good option. Uh, so is Fort St. John and Calgary is another option. These are all very big places, okay? Lethbridge, uh, all great services. So we have some options there as well. Then we get to the USA and from there it's fairly simple. Of course, weather, you know, you, you never know this time of year. But then I'm kind of looking right underneath our route as we push our way east and what airports are there. I see uh, Dickinson, So we'll put Dickinson in there. Uh, what else we got? Kind of puts us through the Minneapolis area. We don't necessarily have to go through that area. So I'm gonna say, let's go 
just north of there somewhere. I'm just picking out a random airport for now. And then one last leg to Oshkosh. So there it is. There is the route in its entirety. And it's a, a pretty big route. Let's see what our flight plan says in terms of miles. 2,800 miles and, uh, and probably plus some because we're gonna be weaving through the mountains, not that perfect line. So it's definitely gonna be more than 3,000 miles going down. It's a crazy route. So we could start to calculate how much time that's gonna be. If I remember right, the iPad said it was gonna be about 24 hours when I first began the trip. It doesn't take into account the, the things that go differently, the routing that goes differently. So it's probably gonna end up being between 30 and 40 hours on the way down, just based on other little things that are different along the route. So quite the trip. Obviously we can't do that all in one day and we need to break it down into several different segments. So I'm going to break this down now in different days and why we decided to go on those days to those airports and why. So one of the big considerations we had as we were going along is we wanted to get services and information about every airport we were going to stay at. We wanted to know if we could get a heated hangar. We wanted to know if they had fuel and we wanted to know if there was a good place for us to stay for the night and maybe even something good to eat. We just wanted this to be that part to be a fairly simple thing for us. And so that took a lot of pre-planning. Um, just as an example, one thing you can do, if I'm just zooming in here, let me turn on our aeronautical charts for the US. I'm gonna go in here to Toke Junction, which is a fairly small town. It's, the, it's 40 miles from the border of Canada. So it's one of the first major towns, or the first major town, if you wanna call it major, it's really a village uh, that you come to when you come to Alaska. So I'm not super familiar with that area of Alaska. I, I don't fly over there that much. It would be like flying three states away for many of you. So I'm just not up there that often and I don't know that many people and I don't know what kind of services they have. So one thing you can do in ForeFlight is you can click on the airport and you have information if you click on FBOs that is there. So obviously not a lot of information here. We've got 40 mile air and fast Eddie's restaurant. Um, but this gives us gas prices it gives us a number to call and, uh, we can just start talking to people along the way. We can call 40 mile air in this case. We can ask them if they have a heated hanger. We can ask them any other services, closing times, things like that, that we need. Just make sure that we aren't painting ourselves in a corner when it comes to those things. That's kind of that. We did that for almost every single airport along the way. We reached out to people on Facebook through different Facebook community groups and asked if anyone would help along the way, especially in Canada where we really don't know anyone. And, and a lot of people uh, have come forward and are willing to help depending on where we stop along the way. So that's the thing is we kind of don't know where we're going to be every night. We're just going to go as far as we can. Sometimes that'll be shorter than we want to go. And sometimes that'll be further. Then once we're there, we know already that we have those services and we're not really stressed about it. So that's kind of kind of big picture thinking is just making sure we have the support and services along the way as we go throughout this flight. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you, as I said, day by day, what we're going to do and where we're going to go. So let me kind of just break this down. First, I'm going to go to my favorites. Um, I have my favorites saved here. I'm going to look at part one. So ideally, our plan would be to get into Canada on the first day. We'd fly all the way from Homer all the way over to Whitehorse. We know some good people in Whitehorse that will hang us for the night. Um, Whitehorse is a fairly large city. There are places to stay there, places to eat. We can get a heated hangar. So that is ideally where we would want to go the first day. Um, this isn't a huge flight. It's going to be 633 miles. So we will do a fuel stop halfway, which could either be Anchorage where we have some, and actually it's Merrill filled. We have some friends at hangar 49 there that will hangar us and they have fuel and uh, we also have Toke as an option. There aren't a lot of great places to stay in Gulcana. There's not a heated hangar, so that's not really a great option. Uh, we could make it work if there's an emergency. I do have a contact there 
but I'm not sure about getting a hanger there. So I kind of want to avoid staying there. If we had to, I'd rather stay in Merrill with hangar 49 than Golcana. It's really only an hour and change flight difference anyway. So then from Toke, we would get all of our border clearance stuff with both the US telling them that we're leaving and with Canada, tell them that we're coming and get clearance to come in. They'll get our passports and everything ahead of time. And we already have a bunch of paperwork. We'll talk about that in a separate video. And then we'll go on into Whitehorse and stay the night there. Um, there's really only one option for that because the, the airports that are further down the road, Watson Lake, and Fort Nelson are not good places to stop. So it's kind of like we have to stage in Toke or Whitehorse to start the day. There's not really a great option to stay anywhere else. And we kind of have to do that entire run in one day. Of course, if we have to, we'll make it work. We have the wing covers, we have emergency gear, a bunch of other things to help us out. So that's day one. It would be ideal if we could get into Canada um, of course, knowing that along the way we have places we could stop if we absolutely need to. So looking at part two, part two, we would go from Whitehorse to Fort St. John or Grand Prairie. So this route would take us through the entirety of the uh, the Alcan Highway in the Canadian Rockies and kind of get us out into more civilization. So near Edmonton, Alberta, and uh, in Fort St. John and Grand Prairie are both pretty big places. So we'd have a lot of services there. Fort Nelson uh, here is, is a mining town from what I understand or an oil town, one or the other. And it's kind of a rough place I heard. So I heard the hotels weren't good and all sorts of stuff that could be just rumor, but I was told that avoid staying there if you can. And, and the, the gas prices are really expensive there too. So I can imagine it just being very, very expensive to stay there. I think they told us it'd be $400 for a hangar for a night. And I just don't like the thought of staying there. I'd rather get south faster. So uh, we take off from Whitehorse. We'd go down to, let me pull up the Canadian maps here, by the way, which is very easy with four flight, which I'll show you something really cool. Um, you see these little dotted lines here that kind of follow this route. This is like a VFR route that you follow and it's going right along the highway. That's a really cool feature of the Canadian maps that that I, I like. So um, basically that's what we followed the entire time. Again, the idea is to go from Whitehorse and we're gonna just skip to the different airports that are along the way, following the highway, having different options. Even if we had to land on the highway, it is definitely possible um, good place to land other than, you know, look at what's here in the middle of nowhere and it's really not far off the road. There's just nothing out there. So it's good to be near civilization as I talked about in the beginning of the video. So we would go from Whitehorse, we'd weave our way through the Alcan, we'd go to uh, Watson Lake, which is a, a beautiful area, a historical airport where they had the lend lease, um, operation during World War II, thousands of World War II aircraft went through there on their way to Russia for the war. So that's very historical. I'm excited to go there. And then we're gonna follow the highway. As you can see here, this is an example of how actually we're kind of gonna be doing this. But right now I have this route crudely drawn as just that straight route. So we're gonna follow the highway down and we're going to go through this. I know we're gonna go through this area because it's really pretty through Muncho Lake and then on to Fort Nelson where we'll get fuel and then we want to get in we want to get into Fort St. John or Grand Prairie before nightfall on day two so that's our plan there um, big haul there so that one's going to be a big day again kind of like the previous day 630 miles ish and if we add Grand Prairie in there It'll be 718. So huge day, um, especially in a slow 172. It'll just take a, a good amount of time. All right, so that's day two. Let's look at day three now and see kind of what that route's going to be like, just heading straight south to try to get to warmer temperatures. All right, so here's day three, and we'll pop that up. So this one starts in Fort St. John which is kind of my my worst case scenario. I really don't want to stay in Fort Nelson. I would have I would do it if I had to, but I'd rather stay somewhere where we have some contacts 
that uh, that could offer help with a hangar or some other services. So we'll go Fort St. John, Grand Prairie is an option, White Court is an option for fuel. There's Red Deer, I think that's, oh, that's Drayton Valley. Red Deer is around here somewhere. There's Red Deer, uh, Calgary, of course. There's Rocky Mountain House here. A lot of these airports are very doable. And then Lethbridge. So Lethbridge is a good place to stop for fuel. Um, contact the border because this isn't very far from the border and talk to US Customs, talk to Canadian Customs. You don't really have to talk to Canadian Customs about leaving, but with COVID, they do want you to tell them that you've left. So that is one thing But you, we definitely need to get permission by the United States to come back in for them to expect us. So we will call them up, give them our estimated time of arrival. That's gonna be a lot easier to do precisely from the ground, everything kind of done not in a rush knowing that we can get there and that we're in good cell service and everything so we'll regroup at lethbridge and then we'll head down to um, great falls great falls for the night check in with customs get everything settled in there back in the usa and then we're set up for our final day which is going to be day four of travel this is all like kind of pie in the sky by the way this is this is pretty big flying each day i'm not sure it's really going to happen so we get into part four, which I showed you guys a second ago, which is basically just gunning it eastbound uh, almost as fast as we can. So we go from Great Falls, Montana. We start to get into North Dakota, um, passing Dickinson, Bismarck, both good airports. And you can just see how many airports now we have along the way as options. You almost don't have to do your homework here. It is still good to know the cities that you can stay in, but almost, you know, the United States just has such a different airport system, especially the lower 48, that we just have a lot of options, but lots of places to stop. We're mainly stopping for fuel, um, kind of hopping our way down, uh, have a friend in North Minneapolis, we might go see if there's time, and then uh, we will go to Oshkosh, where AirVenture is held, but where this thing's gonna get an extreme panel makeover. So. It's a lot. Uh, this is a very big trip. Um, there are a lot of considerations involved and the framework that we're working within is incredibly important to know that we're not gonna push ourselves so hard that we're flying into the night while we're in the mountains and you know, unfamiliar with the territory with not a lot of airports around. There's just all these kind of dark corners you can get in and you have to be really careful to kind of set the stage before you go into this process. We don't quite know where we're gonna be starting each day. Maybe we had to stay somewhere different the night before. Maybe we didn't get quite get as far as we wanted to go, and we kind of have to think about what the next steps are to make that happen. We have a lot of time built in to make sure that we can have wiggle room there and not feel so stressed. So our families will be expecting us to be gone longer. We can purchase airline tickets on the other side, knowing full well that we can just change them. That's not a big deal if we even had to pay for the changes. So there are all these little things that kind of add to the external pressure. And we want to just take that away. We want to plan the trip well with four flight. We want to have a structure in order to do it safely. And then once we get into it, we're just going to be executing it every day, making sure that our weather is good, our services are good, the aircraft is working great and we have a, a more granular plan for each leg as we go through it. So these are all things that are coming. We are actually going to be flying this trip and you guys get to see it because I've got cameras all over the plane. It's gonna be a, a very interesting process to not only fly, but to fly through Canada and to fly during the winter. It's just a big adventure and it's gonna be a lot of fun. So make sure that you subscribe and not only subscribe turn on that notification bell and click all notifications we will send you that video right away and you guys can see it each and every week so make sure again hit subscribe and all notifications of course like this video if you liked it share it with others this was something that was highly requested all of this flight planning that can kind of give you guys an idea of what we're thinking about as commercial pilots what i'm thinking about as an instructor and I hope it was helpful for you in some way. It kind of gives you a framework of where we're going and then we are going to be executing it day by day and you can see what that process is like as well. So 
Hope you enjoyed this video, and I'm excited to see you next time. Until then, throttle on. Ah!